And hi, Sandy. Hi. Okay. So it looks like there's one interpreter on. Miss promoted her. I'll help you promote. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Marina and Charles, for joining us. Um, I'm going to make an early announcement while we're waiting for our for our quorum, and then um, Marina or Charles, did you want to translate for me first? Who wanted to translate for me first, and I'll put the other one in interpretation services. Interpreter Charles can go into Spanish interpreting first. Okay, let me start that. I'll put you in the Spanish channel first, right, Charles? Correct. Okay, thank you. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel. To do so, click on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar that looks like a globe. Once you finish the Spanish, once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Marina, would you mind translating that for us, please? Sure. Uh, buenas noches. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Para usar eh, la característica del Zoom, eh, perdón, de la interpretación, <coughs> eh, hagan el clic en el globito que está en la parte del fondo de su pantalla. Uh, escojan español. Y, y pónganle mute al, al lenguaje, al idioma original. Gracias. Thank you. So, we Stephanie, do, is it, do we, we have, have a quorum? quorum? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and call to order tonight's uh, meeting of the Charter Review Committee and ask for roll call, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Weeks. Here. Member Walsh. Member Villalobos. Member Pitt. Yes. Member Oliveras. Here. Member Miner. Present. Member Miller. Mr. Miller. I can see you. I'll mark you present since we can see you. Uh, Member Mazia. Yes. Member Martinez. Member Ling. I'm here. Member Close. Member Gudinho. I'm here. Member Diaz. Member Cunningham. I'm here. Member Condren. Here. Member Byrne. Here. Member Bartley. Here. Member Bedenford. Here. Member Barber. Member Arizon. Here. Thank you. Chair Cisco. Here. Okay, let me go back. Uh, Member Villalobos, have you joined us? Here. Thank you. Member Walsh, have you joined us? Member Martinez, have you joined us? Member Close, have you joined us? 
Member Diaz, have you joined us? Okay, let the record show that all committee members are here with the exception of committee members Barber. I'm here. Oh, you're here, thank you. Okay, let the member record show that all committee members are here with the exception of committee members Diaz, Close, Martinez, and Walsh. Oh, I see member Close coming on. Member Close, have you connected to the meeting? Yes. Okay, so I uh, updated the roll call to show Member Close um, present. Okay, so with that, there's just some housekeeping um, notes here. Um, just remind committee members to keep your audio muted unless you are speaking. And then as members of the public join the meeting via Zoom, they'll be participating as an attendee and cameras and microphones will be muted. If you're calling from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comments portion of the agenda for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. The City of Santa Rosa is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and are well staffed to monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. If necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. Public comments will be heard after each agenda item is presented. After each agenda item is presented, Chair Cisco will ask for the committee member comments and then open it up for public comment. If you are participating from Zoom or by telephone and wish to make a live public comment on a specific item, at the time public comment is opened by Chair Cisco for that item, please use the raise hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. Throughout today's agenda, when Chair Cisco calls for public comment, an interpreter will be prepared to assist anyone needing interpretation services. Those using interpreter support will be afforded additional time for public comment as required by the Brown Act. We ask those listening on the Spanish channel but wishing to make a public comment to turn off the interpretation channel entirely at the time you hear your name called so you can join the main channel to make your public comment heard and translate it into English. This icon may now look like a circle with an ES in the middle and the word Spanish underneath. You can then rejoin the Spanish channel at the conclusion of your comment to continue listening in Spanish. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to let you know, Stephanie, I did get a message from uh, Ana Diaz that she's trying to get in. So she, she'll hopefully be able to join us soon. Okay. And if, yes, yeah, so we'll keep an eye out for her name. Um, yeah, she's having some trouble logging in. So, okay. Yeah. And just so um, to committee members, if you log in using your iPad and use the link that was sent out just shortly before the meeting, you will be. Um, joining as a panelist and won't need to be promoted. So I just want to remind committee members to please use the iPad that you were issued to join the meeting using the link that Dina emails to your city email address. We do not use your personal email addresses to send out um, the agenda or the meeting links. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, public comments on non-agenda matters, uh, which is a time for any member of the public to address the committee um, on matters not listed on tonight's agenda, but that are of interest to the committee. Um, again, if you're uh, participating by Zoom, use your raise hand feature so you can be recognized by the host and you'll be given three minutes to speak. If you're dialing in by phone, please dial star nine and uh, similarly, you'll be recognized by the host. So with that, I'll go ahead and open public comments and um, check with our host to see if anyone is there wishing to speak. Um, Chair Cisco, I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Would you like our interpreter to translate about the raised hand again for those who have just joined? Are we okay? Um, Before we gave I that information. 
we did do that interpretation at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then I'm going to go ahead. And why don't we go ahead and do that again, real quick? Oh, okay. Thank you, um, Marina. Would you mind okay. translating okay. The, uh, how to how to call in or how to raise your hand, and then we'll I'll move you into the Spanish channel, please. And thank you. Sure, of course. Um, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to say it in English again. I'm so sorry because <laughs> I was. I, Charles was, was interpreting that into, yeah. Sure, okay. sure. Um, yeah, we're asking uh, any members of the public if they're uh, wanting to uh, make a comment under uh, public comments, non-agenda items, and they're participating by Zoom to use the raised hand feature so that they can be recognized, or if they're calling in to use the uh, star nine feature so that they can be recognized okay. and uh, asked to speak for the, Three minutes. Ok, entonces para las personas que quieren hacer comentarios sobre los uh, puntos que no están en la agenda eh, y están llamando por medio de Zoom, eh, pueden uh, usar eh, la mano levantada. Si están llamando por teléfono, pueden usar eh, estrella 9 para así que los uh, que puedan hacer su, su pregunta. Gracias. Great, thank you. And, and I don't see any raised hands, so I'm going to go ahead and put her into the Spanish channel. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, that public comment item. Uh, move on to uh, item three, which is approval of minutes. We don't have any minutes this evening. And with that, we'll move on to our scheduled items, beginning with um, a recurring item uh, 4.1, our equity principles. And is Sakura uh, going to be giving a presentation on that? Hi, good evening. Yes, I do have, I am ready to facilitate the discussion. It's not so much a PowerPoint as it is looking at the document together. Hopefully um, this will be a version that perhaps we can bring forward for a formal acceptance. But I did want to bring everybody's attention to the documents that are attached. There are two versions of the equity principles. Please look at the updated version. And then the equity priority maps and the definitions page is included only to be of ease to you to access, but not necessarily complete uh, relevant to this conversation right now, but just trying to make sure that those tools that you might need are at, your, at the ready for you. So over the um, last two weeks, I wish everyone a happy new year and I hope you had a great holiday season and I hope you're staying Omicron safe. So getting that all out of the way. Uh, had a chance to speak with our seed consultant about what this committee had asked for and the way that you're kind of trailblazing how we might approach looking at equity and embedding it in our work. And um, so he helped me with Taylor a couple of the things. I think they're small adjustments. We did add a mission statement for us. Uh, he added the value of equity and trust. We then thought about a way to create some parallel structures for the norms and principles. And I hope that um, if there are questions or discussion points, I hope we got all of the recommendations from before in terms of fixes. I've looked at this numerous times and I'm sure there's still a period somewhere or a comma that I missed. So please bring that to my attention. And once we get for further clarity that this is an, a version that you like, we will make it more visually and graphically pleasing. We're also kind of researching how to get that done for you. And it will of course be translated. Great. Um, any questions of Socorro right now? before I ask for public comment. I, I have a question, Chair Cisco. Um, I can't, tell me who you are. <laughs> Sorry, Jasmine, I have a question. Oh, oh hi. okay, Jocelyn, good. Thank <laughs> you, oh, yeah, no, Jasmine. Didn't Jasmine. see your hand. <laughs> yeah, okay, so my question is, um, on the documents uh, that show the equity priority areas, there was, um, on the legend, um, there are some that outline where there's top 25% below poverty and then also top 25% uh, people of color and then also equity priorities. Um, 
you know, because of historical events have disproportionately um, underserved and oppressed certain groups, specifically people of color, I would assume that there is some overlap between categories, um, as you know, we see in other areas of disparity. So I wonder, um, you know, I didn't really see any overlap in terms of priority areas or, or those categories, um, as far as I can see in the map. So I'm wondering where those overlap and how, how do you tell um, where they're overlapping? Um, let me pull that up. I can share that the, our city expert on these maps is Beatriz uh, Guerrero, and she is away today, but certainly she could bring forward her process for defining these areas so that everyone's quite clear. But I, I actually, believe, let me pull it up. The map is actually the overlap areas. There are actually two other maps that are just them. Uh, but the areas that are highlighted as our priority areas are where there is overlap. But um, let me make sure, let me make sure. But yes, you are absolutely right. Um, commissioner that, it, or yeah, commission, this is a commission? Committee. Committee, <laughs> committee member. Committee member. Um, that, uh, that is what we're looking for, is that historical overlap and kind of that compounded harm. So yes. Um, but again, I need to find that document. Do, 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 do. I can, if it's a question that needs to um, come back later, you know, um, if it needs to be, go, go to the specialist, that's okay too. Yes. Yes, so I, I, what I believe is true, and I, again, I'll work with Sue in the chair to see if it's appropriate, when it might be appropriate to have a, short presentation from Beatriz, but the green areas do actually indicate the overlap where they're independently yellow or independently blue are areas of import, but not overlap. Got it, thank you. I think any other wheel. questions before I go to public comment? This is Ryan Miller. Um, okay. I had a, uh, there were, uh, were uh, some places where previous uh, ballots failed and we're gonna be working on this. I'd like to know what caused them to fail if you, if that can be determined. Okay, um, I'm not sure where that fits into this particular discussion, but we're gonna hold that question in, a, in the parking lot because I think it's a very good question for, mm -hmm kind of where we're headed. So um, mm -hmm. let's hold on to that one. Thank you. Um, any other, yeah, Christine. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, Sakura, thank you so much again for providing these resources and doing all the presentations for us, super appreciate it. Um, I love this document in general, and in particular, I'm looking at the norms list and number one is all about access, so y'all can read it, but provide a diverse array of channels through which the public can provide input, welcome all comments and questions. And I guess what I'm wondering from you, Socorro, is if you can provide any recommendations for us as a committee for procedures for how we could live up to that norm or really embody that norm in the work that we're doing. Uh, certainly, I think that when you establish your areas that you know you want to discuss. I mean, right, because there is some funneling down of concepts and, and ideas that has to be done before you kind of sink your teeth into the, the finesse of that. I think that um, depending on uh, how the chair and, and Sue see the process, all along the way, we have many, um, we have many existing um, commissions and, uh, and appointed councils within the city. So like for them to be arms of collecting information, the CAB is another, and we do have an office of engagement that if these were specific and not kind of a, a generics, you know, so free for all, there are ways, and we have a fabulous communications department, which can utilize um, the city newsletter and other things like that. We have you know, uh, we broadcast things. So there are ways while there's, um, while things, while the meetings are um, paused, we could run a slide or something for more information to get people's interest. 
there are multiple ways. I think the, the challenge for this group will be where your points are that you want the most input, because I think there is a point too of diminishing returns. You can't necessarily ask multiple times for multiple. So you really have to have a clear focus and decide when the most critical parts will be to get feedback from the community. And then I think there are multiple ways and departments in this city that can help facilitate that once narrowed. And we have many media, bilingual radio stations, the Press Democrat. I mean, there's so many, again, when we're focused and, and intentional in that. Great, well, I yeah, appreciate okay. that range of support that is being offered. Yeah, and one of, one of the things that I think is gonna be important is that we, we focus that so that that feedback comes through to us during these meetings. So, you know, whatever our, our outreach is, it's about, um, you know, posting the agendas in certain places that, so that people know that this is going on, but so that the feedback comes through to us through this meeting, uh, similar to how a city council meeting goes. So. Um, that, that would be kind of what I'm looking for in terms of uh, the, our access um, so that, uh, you know, the, the community knows that this is going on and then how they can participate here. So, okay. Um, any other questions before we go to public comment? Okay, not seeing any. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open it to uh, the public. Again, um, if you're participating by Zoom and you wish to uh, participate by Zoom, use your raised hand feature so that you can be recognized. Uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, this would be on the item about equity principles. Um, and if you're dialing in by phone, if you could use uh, star uh, nine, you'd be recognized. And I'll check with the host to see. And Chair Cisco, I don't see any raised hands currently. Okay, great. So then I'm gonna bring it back to us. Um, I just, I have a couple of comments, Socorro. Um, you know, we've been using this, this document um, as a model that came from uh, the redistricting process. And under principles, um, I'm wondering about, I know we took out the references to redistricting and, and put in, in the commission, but I'm concerned about um, uh, how the language for the principles in particular can be modified because their charge was different than what our charge was. Their charge was to go out and engage the community because different maps were gonna be drawn. And I'm a little concerned about the language under two, four, and five, uh, not the titles, uh, not the spirit, but just to, to have the language not in, in insinuate that there's going to be, um, well, not to have it look like a, a redistricting process is going as what's going on here. Um, because basically it's, um, you know, we're doing a layered process the redistricting process, they only had the opportunity to go in front of the Board of Supervisors who ultimately decided on the maps. Whereas in this process, um, whatever we make our recommendation to the City Council, they're going to have two public hearings on those recommendations. And ultimately, it's the voters at large that, that take the vote. So there's going to be, you know, a wider, uh, they have more choice than what the redistricting was. So I don't know how to change that language, but I just don't want to insinuate or that 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 it's exactly the same. We're not engaged in the process that the, that redistricting committee was engaged in in terms of collecting um, preferences and uh, about where the lines are drawn and things like that. Does, does that make sense? It does. I would say for the principles in particular, those were actually changed. Um, Quite a, a, quite a bit actually. Okay. From the redistricting uh, and after discussions with kind of seed and their perspective and they had no involvement at all with the redistricting. 
But the okay. idea, this does reflect the city's commitment to targeted universalism. So again, okay. uplifting goals for all, and then okay. noticing the strategies that are different. And uh, yeah, I, I think this actually it, it similar in a vein, but it, but I leave it for the group to discuss. Okay, well, I just if you're if you've looked at it and you think that it's clear that I'm I'm comfortable with that if the other committee members are comfortable with that. So just it just raised that question for me. It's just I don't want to, um, you know, we're not going through that process that the redistricting did. So okay. Absolutely. Anything else we want to say on this item? Okay. Well, again, thanks for all your information, Socorro, and help. Appreciate it. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay. With that, we're going to move on to item 4.2. Uh, we need to um, elect a vice chair uh, this evening. And um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of explain how we're going to go about doing that. Um, I'm going to explain how we're going to do it. We do have to take, uh, you know, if you have questions, you can ask questions. I'll go to the public as we typically do. Um, but when we get to the to the point of uh, making nominations, what I'm going to do is ask uh, for nominations. And so raise your hand. I'll call on you. You can give me uh, if you plan to nominate an individual. Uh, before I call for a second on that nomination, I will check with that individual to make sure they are willing to serve. And if they are, then I'll go ahead and call for a second and then call for any other nominations. And it, when we have um, a, a slate, uh, we do have to do an oral vote. So um, then we can call on each person to vote for whatever candidate they, they choose to. So any, any questions on the method? Stephanie, I would yeah. ask that when a nomination is made in a second that the votes are done separately because they can't do a motion um, for several nominations. So if there's one nomination and a second, we can vote on it so that it reflects in my minutes the way the program works. Um, I can only put in one motion at a time. <laughs> so we can't uh, that's going to be kind of confusing because if we have one nominee and we all vote, yeah, I'm not quite sure how we can do that. So Sue, how do you um, suggest? Yeah, I think this is going to be a little bit different than we've done it at the council for various um, appointments. Um, but I would recommend uh, we'll, we'll accept nominations. And then uh, once we have the nominations, however many people are nominated, uh, we take a vote at that point and each uh, committee member will vote for one, uh, one uh, committee, one individual to be vice chair. And whoever receives the most votes would become the vice chair. Um, the process though is not set in stone. So if there are you know, if the chair wants to consider other processes, um, she can certainly do that. But I think that's probably the simplest way to move forward. Okay. It may be a little clunky when I do the roll call for voting. Um, so just bear, bear with me and be patient. <laughs> and at that point, I'll also keep track of the votes. So um, hopefully <clears throat> between the two of us and others, we can keep things straight. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions from committee members before I ask for public comment? Not seeing any. You do have some hands up. Oh, yep. There's Mr. Oliveras. You had one. No, I was just saying that there are hands up. <clears throat> yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Say my, that again. I have my hand up, Annie. Oh. Uh, okay, <clears throat> Annie. Sorry. And Didn't Karen has it. hers up also. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so is this simply someone who would? Would their responsibility be to step in when you cannot be here? Is That's that pretty much the responsibility. Yeah. Okay. And and to work with me to make sure that um, you know, prior to meetings, they're clear on the agenda so that if I had to be absent, they they would be uh, able to do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh Karen, you have a question? Uh, yeah, Patty. So you're gonna do public um 
comments and then bring it back to us for yes. a nomination? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's that's what I'm told I'm doing. Okay, <laughs> no, and, and any other questions? So, yes. Trisha, so did you want to have the nominations on the table before you take public comment or did you want to take public comment prior to names being on the table? Well, <laughs> What do you suggest? Because <laughs> I'm just looking at how, how we typically do it. I don't know if the public might want to make a comment about how we take the nominations. Sure. I, I, I don't know, so. That's fine, sure. You want, you want to go ahead and do it that way? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, with that, I'll go ahead and open um, the opportunity for public comment on uh, item 4.2. Again, if you're on Zoom, use your raise hand feature. If you're dialing in by phone, dial star nine and uh, you'll be able to participate. And um, this is for item 4.2, selection of vice chair public comments. Yes. And I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and come back to the committee and um, would somebody like to make a nomination? I would, this is Karen. Karen, okay. Um, I'd like to nominate Ernesto Oliveras as vice chair. Okay. Um, Ernesto, are you willing to accept that nomination? I would be honored, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, can I call for a second? Second. Who, 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 was, that? who was that? Dan. Dan. Okay. Dan seconded. Okay. And any other nominations seeing uh, Christine? Yeah, I'd like to nominate Jasmine Gudina. Okay. And Jasmine, are you, would you be willing to serve if uh, selected? Yes, thank you for the nomination. Okay. And Annie Barber would be happy to um, second that. Okay. Second it. Okay. Any other nominations? Uh, Lisa. I thank you. I'd like to uh, nominate Logan Pitts. And Logan, uh, would you be willing to serve if? I will have to decline that. It's possible I will have to miss some April meetings due to travel. So I don't want to put the committee in that position. Um, I, ca I can't understand you, Logan. So could you could you tell us again? Oh, I'm going to decline that, Patty. I might have scheduling okay. issues. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I don't need a second on that then. Um, and any other? Okay, not seeing any other. Um, okay, so we have two nominees. Um, Ernesto Oliveras, nominated by Karen Weeks, seconded uh, by Dan Condren, and we have um, Jasmine, uh, nominated by Christine and seconded by Annie Barber. So um, with that, as bumpy as it may be, Stephanie, would you take our call for our votes, please? One moment. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> Member Weeks? Aye. Or yes for Oliveira. Are we voting on Ernesto first and then? Okay. Well, yeah, you yeah. have to vote for who you're going to vote for. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's Ernest the only way we can figure out how to do Thank this. Thank you. So. <laughs> uh, Ernesto okay. for okay. vice chair. Okay. 
so we're only voting on Ernesto right now, right? And if you want him, you vote yes. And if you don't, you vote no. Is that how we're doing this? I was just going to have no. you go through the roll once and, and enter the names. But if you think that's a better method for you, Stephanie, okay. I'm, we could do that. Uh, let me bring up a different document then. Okay. Whatever makes it easy for you. Yeah. Let me just bring up this other document. <clears throat> Karen, um, committee member Walsh is absent. Um, member Villalobos? Jasmine. Member Pitts? I'm voting for member Jasmine Gudina. Member Oliveris? I would vote for myself. Member Minor? I vote for Jasmine. Member Miller? I vote for uh, Ernesto Oliveris. Member Mazia? Or Ernesto, please. Member Martinez is absent. Member Ling. Vote for uh, Member Olivares. Thank you. Member Close. I vote for Member Olivares. Member Gudino. Uh, I would like to vote for myself. Thank you. Member Diaz? Ms. Jasmine Gudino. Mm -hmm. Member Cunningham? Um, Member Gudino. Member Condren? I vote for Member Oliveras. Member Byrne? Vote for member Jasmine Gudino. Member Bartley? Uh, Mr. Oliveras. Member Badenford? Member Oliveras. They feel intimidated. Member Barber? I vote for Jasmine. Member Arizona? Jasmine Gudino, please. And Chair Cisco. Um, uh, for Ernesto Oliveras. So I'm getting 10 uh, for Ernesto and nine for Jasmine. Does that match everybody else's count? Everybody's nodding. Okay. Okay. So um, welcome Ernesto to uh, your post as vice chair. Thanks for being willing to do it. And thank you, Jasmine, for also being willing to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so next, I'm sorry, what? No, I just, I was just saying thank you. Okay, great. All right, so tonight uh, we are about to move on to our uh, main item, which is 4.3, our uh, presentation and discussion on council compensation. And I believe, Sue, you're going to start with that. Uh, yes, I will. Um, and I'll try to go through the presentation, it's a little bit long, um, but I'll try to go through it fairly quickly so that uh, the committee has ample time to uh, engage in a discussion and deliberation. So, 
Um, of course, this is a continued discussion. We did start it at our last meeting. Uh, next slide. And this is just a reminder of what the current council compensation is. Um, this is set forth in our charter, uh, set forth in our charter that the compensation will be determined in accordance with state law, uh, with the exception that the mayor gets 150% of the council member salary. And as we talked about last time, the state law sets forth a schedule of council compensation based on city population. Uh, and for Santa Rosa, a population of almost 180,000, we fall into the category of cities with population between 150 and 250,000. And the state law provides uh, for a salary of $800 a month. Next slide. State law uh, does allow that uh, monthly salary to be increased um, up to 5% per calendar year. That 5% is a flat rate, so it's not compounded. So the maximum income increase, this is a monthly, is $40 per month. Uh, so after year one, it could have been 840, the year after 880 and so forth. And the, eight, the $40 per month increase accumulates if it's not immediately applied. Um, and uh, the state law states it's calculated from the operative date of the last adjustment. The increase uh, is a, has to be adopted by council ordinance. It does not go into effect uh, automatically. So next slide. As we talked about last time, uh, the council compensation has not been adjusted for just about a decade. Uh, so under the current law, the council by ordinance uh, could adjust its monthly salary by $40 for each of the last 10 years. That would be a total one-time increase in monthly salary of $400. Uh, that would result in a new monthly council member salary of $1,200. That's the existing 800 plus the increase of 400 leading to $1,200 a month. And this would result in a new annual salary of uh, $14,400. That's for the council members. Next slide. For the mayor, a little bit more. Uh, mayor currently receives $1,200 a month. And again, you could have the 5% increase, which would be equal to $60 for each of the last 10 years. That would be a one-time increase in monthly salary of $600. That would result in a new monthly mayor salary total of $1,800 a month. And that would result in an annual salary of $21,600. Again, this is what could be possible uh, by council action alone, a council adoption of an ordinance. They can do that uh, at any time. Next slide. Um, the adjustments, however, uh, are go into effect only when uh, at least one council member begins a new term. It doesn't have to be a new council, new individual on the council, but at least one council member begins a new term. So since our elections occur every other year, the adjustments can be made every other year. And they, again, they're not automatic, so they have to be done, um, uh, done by the council, kind of looking, looking backwards. Um, with an election coming up next year, the council does have the opportunity, the option of uh, uh, making that adjustment uh, by ordinance anytime between now and November. Next slide. Uh, so there are alternatives um, to this process. Um, the charter's provision uh, that links uh, the council's compensation to state law, that is optional. Uh, it's compensation is a matter of municipal affairs. And if you remember uh, back towards the beginning, uh, if it's a matter of municipal affairs, uh, the, uh, the voters of the city of Santa Rosa can uh, change uh, uh, the charter as they wish. So this is fully within the discretion of the city voters. Uh, the voters, as I say here, can set whatever council compensation they deem appropriate. Uh, there are no limits uh, under state law. Next slide. So that was all kind of where we are right now. Uh, so how are we going forward? Um, I 
we talked a little bit last time about what we're trying to solve. And I really wanna um, have everyone keep that very much in mind. Uh, what are the most important elements in your eyes? Um, you are the committee that's been appointed um, to uh, make a recommendation. We talked last time about um, would an increase in council compensation increase opportunities for greater diversity uh, on the council? Uh, would it encourage uh, a continued recruitment of strong candidates, at least not discourage people from, from running? Um, we talked a little bit last time too about the fairness to council members. We looked at um, the mayor's schedule and recognize the amount of work um, that he does, that he is re required, really obligated to do as mayor uh, is, is virtually a full-time um, job. And are there other issues that we didn't talk about last week? Are there other issues um, that committee members feel are important and uh, that we are trying to address by increasing council uh, compensation? Um, among the, uh, among the item uh, materials that were provided uh, in the, with the agenda um, was the Berkeley uh, measure JJ um, that was passed by the voters in 2020. Um, and I do recommend reading particularly for relative to this slide, um, recommend reading the arguments uh, that were made for and against that measure. That measure substantially increased council member salaries and I'll, I'll just read just a brief part of it. Um, and that is Berkeley's new public financing of elections makes it possible for candidates with important perspectives to run, but the very low compensation makes it impossible for many to serve. Single parents, young people without generational wealth, people of color and working class residents are hindered by the compensation, which was set over 20 years ago and has not kept pace with the area cost of living. Uh, that argument is much longer and goes on, but I just wanted that clip, I think captures um, some of the sense of the council uh, when they asked this committee to at least uh, look at and consider amendments relative to council uh, compensation. A couple of um, things also that are not on this slide, but I think are helpful to think about is what are our expectations of council members? Again, you saw um, the mayor's uh, agenda. Um, if we pulled up an agenda from one of the council members, you'd see also that uh, very um, extensive obligations uh, for both council members and for the mayor. So is it the community's expectation that these are essentially full-time positions, part-time positions? What's that expectation? Also, how has the job changed in the last 10 years since, uh, since the $800 a month uh, went into effect? And then third, um, we might talk about it a little bit later, is how do the benefits, um, benefits fit in? So council members receive salary, but they also receive benefits, health and other benefits um, from the city. So a couple of things to think about. Next slide. Um, I've identified three key decision points. Um, first is how are salaries calculated? How are they determined? That's number one. Second is the dollar amount. And then third, the process. What's the process for setting and updating council member salaries? And we'll walk through the three of those. Next slide. So first, how are salaries um, calculated? And these, um, the next, this slide and the next really outline some of the methods that are used in other cities uh, to determine council salaries. So um, some uh, jurisdictions state a flat dollar amount uh, and that might be in their charter or in an ordinance or in a resolution. So for example, uh, Petaluma has for council members, $5 per meeting, and that's in their charter, $10 per meeting for the mayor. Um, again, you can see there's also the, in Fremont, it's $2,248 per month. Um, so is it per month? Is it per meeting? Is there some other calculation, but then a flat dollar amount? And some jurisdictions, as I note here, do not provide for any uh, specified uh, increases. 
So the next option really is to have a flat dollar amount somewhere, whether in the charter or an ordinance or resolution, but have some provision for an increase. Um, commonly, probably most commonly, it includes a reference to state laws, um, the 5% uh, increase, but some jurisdictions tie it to the uh, CPI or to set some other cap. Livermore, for example, sets uh, increases at the lesser of CPI or 5%. Um, one of the other jurisdictions set a 4% cap. Um, they vary from, from place to place. Next slide. So moving away from a flat rate, um, some jurisdictions tie their council member salary to uh, the salary of some other public official um, and either equal to some other uh, public official salary or some percentage of it. Um, so either equal to or some percentage of a superior court judge salary. There's a couple of jurisdictions that do that, including the County of Sonoma. Um, some set it at a percentage of department head salaries. Um, Oakland references uh, city manager salaries of, of, um, of nearby cities. Um, we talked last time, uh, there was a suggestion from a committee member that maybe it's a, a, a city employee salary, maybe the, the lowest city employee salary uh, on our salary uh, schedule. Instead of tying to some other public official salary, uh, it could be tied to median income. And there are a couple of jurisdictions that do that. Um, Modesto uh, sets it uh, at 50% uh, of um, area median income. Um, there's uh, Berkeley sets it now at 100% of area median income for a three person household uh, for the mayor and then 63% of AMI for or of the mayor's salary for council members. Um, I'll note that that 63% seems like a pretty odd number to pull out, but that was the uh, ratio of the mayor and council member salary prior to it being uh, adopted. Um, also, another option I don't have on here is that we talked before, I think there was some suggestion of minimum wage. Um, could we tie it somehow to minimum wage? And uh, we would have, if we wanna go that direction, would need to think about what, what are the hours that we're attributing uh, to the mayor or to a council member, uh, and then translate that um, uh, multiplied by the, by the minimum wage. Um, just to give you a sense on the, on the median income, median income for, uh, for Sonoma County for a three person household is $92,950. That's 100%, that's area median income. Um, we'll talk and I'm looking at whether I'm gonna talk now or later. Uh, well, we'll talk about this later, uh, increases. But so those are so those are five, I think, different methods of kind of establishing the salary, flat rate, flat rate with some provision for increases, tie it to some other public official salary, tie it to median income, tie it to minimum wage. Next slide. So the second kind of element to look at is the dollar amount. So are you comfortable with where the calculation ends up? If you select a method of calculation, are you comfortable with where that ends up? Um, how does it compare to the level allowed by state law? How does it compare to salaries in similar cities or nearby cities or statewide cities? Does it reasonably reflect the council member workload? Uh, and is it uh, generally acceptable to the voters? Now I wanna emphasize on this last one, um, the politics of council compensa compensation, you know, that's, that's not really the task of this committee. Um, that will be for the council. Um, but that being said, um, it will, of course, um, be part of um, our natural thought process as we're discussing this. What's reasonable? Uh, what might be reasonable uh, to the general public? And again, I want to emphasize as I've mentioned before, we have a, a good, strong, diverse committee here. Um, so this committee in itself can also be a good judge of, of what might be, um, what might seem reasonable to the general public. Um, and before I move 
into the third element, which is process. Just want to mention a couple of other elements. There are a couple of jurisdictions, Modesto and Petaluma in particular, um, that have a reduction for missed meetings. If a council member misses a meeting, you might want to think about whether you want to include that. And then um, the increases, what do we tie the increase to? We could tie it to the 5%, to CPI. If the salaries are tied to public officials, are the, um, uh, if that other public official gets a raise, uh, does a council member also get a raise? If it's tied to area median income, does it rise with the area median income? And um, I will mention with, in particular with um, tying it to other public officials. Um, just want to highlight um, San Diego was not part of our list of cities. It's in Southern California and it's much, much larger than the city of Santa Rosa. So we did not include it on any of our lists. Um, but uh, a few years ago, um, they did, um, uh, the voters approved um, a new salary level for their mayor and council members. Uh, tied to the salary of Supreme Court judges. Um, that at that time, at the time when it was adopted, that raised um, that raised the um, mayor the mayor's salary. And I'm now looking at what it was. Um, it raised it to a hundred and um, six thousand dollars and uh it ran it raised the um sorry to one hundred fifty thousand. Um, but again tied to tied to supreme court judges and last year supreme court judges got a very significant uh, increase and so uh those those automatic increases went into effect and it for the mayor it went from 100,000 to over 200,000. And city council member salaries went from 75,000 to over $125,000, again, just automatically based on, uh, on the increases to some, you know, to the um, Supreme Court judges. So um, we can talk a little bit more about the San Diego example, but that's just a kind of a warning that if you decide to, to tie it to some other public um, officials uh, salary, Think about how you want to deal with um, uh, deal with increases. Next slide. So now the process, um, and the process can be as simple as the actual dollar salary set forth in the charter. Uh, there, instead, you could set forth in the charter a, a cal the calcul method of calculation. Um, there are a number of, there are several jurisdictions. Um, and when we get to the chart, you'll see the three jurisdictions that are um, a, a larger population uh, above Santa Rosa um, have, have appointed commissions to review and recommend salary adjustments. Um, I will caution on those that they can get complicated. Um, a couple of the jurisdictions have that commission meet every other year. Uh, one of the jurisdictions has very specific uh, criteria for who's on that commission. Um, there's a, the, one of the jurisdictions has quite a process of, there have to be at least two public hearings before the um, commission, plus another one or two hearings in front of the council. So it becomes a pretty involved, um, uh, involved uh, process, so. Um, and then you may have other ideas for other procedures um, that you would like to consider. So next slide. Now we'll look at just a little bit at some of the data. Um, I included uh, in, the, in the materials uh, chart, uh, it's also included not only in the PowerPoint, but as an attachment um, to the agenda item, a list of comparable cities this is 11 cities and this county of Sonoma. And this is the list that is currently used by the city uh, for comparison for establishing and evaluating uh, empl city employee salaries. Um, this list is gonna be under review next year. So it could change, but this is the list currently. Um, and it is listed in the order here in the order of population. So um, if, 
you included Santa Rosa in this list directly, it would be the second largest population. Um, under, you know, we currently have the 9,600. Um, the average of the 11 cities is 20,152. And if you look at it just individually, six of the cities, comparable cities, larger and smaller, um, are six of those cities are above um, the Santa Rosa rate. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I was basing that on if it was, if we move to the, what was possible under state law, there would be six above, one essentially equal and three below. If it kept at the 9,600, um, then it's just two of the 11 uh, jurisdictions are below um, our current salary. And of course, the County of Sonoma is much higher at 160, almost 161,000. So that's the comparable cities. Um, then I include a chart, next slide, of uh, North Bay cities. Um, and uh, these are cities from Sonoma County, Northern Marin, and I also added, included the city of Napa. All of these cities are much smaller um, than Santa Rosa. Um, so they may be of minimal um, comparative value. Uh, on the other hand, I thought um, that people might be curious as to what other local jurisdictions have. Um, also on this chart, I started adding in, or Rob and I started adding in uh, where there are health benefits. Um, and I'll mention now that for Santa Rosa, uh, our council members uh, receive health, dental, vision, life insurance, long-term disability and retirement benefits. So, um, I'll also note, and just in looking at this chart, um, Cloverdale and Sonoma, uh, both recently, both are tied to state law and both, uh, both of them are general law cities. And both of them in the last few years considered whether to increase salary based on the 5% allowable under state law. Cloverdale did uh, increase, um, increased their salary from 3,600 to 6,600. And Sonoma County, Sonoma, City of Sonoma, I'm sorry, City of Sonoma uh, declined to increase their salary. So they're still at the, um, at the 3,600 level. Um, next slide. We'll also have a slide at the end that gives the broader California cities data. Um, wanna talk a little bit about what was proposed previously and what was proposed elsewhere. Um, so the measure M from Sonoma County and the measure JJ from Berkeley. Um, measure M was presented to the voters in 20, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 2002. So I wanna emphasize that was 20 years ago. Uh, it would have increased council salaries to 1500 per month with the mayor at 2,250. And it would have given an annual increase uh, uh, equal to that given to city executive staff, but not to exceed CPI and it failed. Um, but I do want to encourage you not to put too much stock in the failure of Measure M. Again, that was 20 years ago. Circumstances have changed. We're now in district elections, um, and you have had the chance to see some of the arguments that were presented in Berkeley and Berkeley passed. Berkeley, of course, is a different community from Santa Rosa, but it, it could be informative. So next slide. So compare the recent Berkeley proposal, um, that's measure JJ presented in 2020, and it set the mayor's salary at median income for a three person household in Alameda County. And then it set the council member salary at 63% of the mayor's salary. And that resulted next slide in a mayor's salary of 107,300 and a council member salary, annual salary of 67,600. And uh, these would be uh, annually adjusted based on changes to the area's median income. And it passed with 64.6 uh, uh, in support. I tried to, I know the uh, counts, uh, next, uh, this, the, some of the committee members asked about, you know, what's the data from experience uh, of other cities? Um, have not, we've not been able to get much uh, data, unfortunately. Um, I did reach out to Cloverdale, um, but their increase was relatively small. Um, and I did not uh, hear back as to whether there was any noticeable impact uh, on, 
council candidacies. Uh, Berkeley, uh, they just adopted this in, 2000, in 2020, so don't yet have uh, experience and what that will mean. And then I will mention in San Diego, um, kind of a, a, a mix of reactions. Again, their salary went up uh, can very significantly. And in looking at um, articles um, that were published uh, both at the time of passage and then uh, more recently, at the time of passage, uh, it was heralded as a great thing uh, uh, to have the increase in salary and that uh, it was attracting uh, high caliber, what was described in the article as high caliber um, candidates, uh, including businessmen, uh, lawyers, uh, but also uh, firefighters. So, um, uh, so interesting. Um, but when, it, when we got that, when they had the automatic increase uh, last year, uh, it was really slammed in the papers uh, for uh, for the amount that was given. And I'm sorry, I had one article that was saying that was tied to the salaries of the Supreme Court judges, uh, but uh, I think the correct answer is that it was tied to the uh, salaries of Superior Court judges, so in San Diego. Next slide. And then this is the chart of um, other California cities, um, and I won't spend a lot of time, it's I know very small print. It, again, it is available also separately as an attachment, um, but you can see, um, again, I think I've covered all of the different elements that are, uh, that show up in this list. Um, I will note again, the benefits, uh, many cities do um, provide for benefits. There are a few that expressly do not. Um, but probably the majority of the cities do also provide uh, benefits, as does Santa Rosa. Next and slide. Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, what kind of benefits are they getting the same benefits that a city of Santa Rosa employee would be getting? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And that's uh, common uh, in the other cities as well, is that if not entirely, there are some cities that are a little bit different, uh, but in most cities, if they're going to give health benefits or health and retirement benefits, uh, they will be the same as uh, is given to other employees. Again, some exceptions in some cities, but. Um, and any other questions? Ron Miller, uh, has any thought been given to the, uh, comparing the cost of living? Uh, Santa Rosa and is, uh, has been a, in, I've heard people complain about it being so expensive to live here. So many people have either moved or many people would like to come here and can't. So has that been considered? The, um, it hasn't been specific. I haven't seen that specifically considered in other cities other than to the extent of um, both in San Diego and in um, Berkeley in, their, in passing their ballot measures. Uh, did emphasize the cost of living in both of those um, locations and the increase in cost of living uh, since the last um, salary adjustment. Um, the comparable cities list for that Santa Rosa uses for employees, um, it, it is, has been subject to some criticism because it does draw from some of the cities that are right central in the Bay Area, uh, which may have even a higher higher cost of living than even in, in Santa Rosa. Um, but um, that, that list of cities was developed kind of specifically to look at what are comparable in terms of cost of living, but what are comparable in terms of cities that provide similar services to Santa Rosa. Um, we are a full service um, city. And so, um, you know, was looking to compare those cities that have that diverse um, service range. Um, committee members, uh, we'll go ahead and take uh, more questions now, uh, then uh, I will call on the public to uh, make their comments, and then we'll come back for discussion. So, so right now we're just doing questions, and Chris, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sue, thanks, very helpful. Um, 
Regarding the experience, uh, I'm wondering, since we have, I guess, decades of experience throughout the state with some cities that have paid more, paid less, is there any type of conclusion or information in terms of do cities that pay more find a more diverse field of candidates or electeds or different level of quality of governance? Is there anything, anything any information we have on that? Um, we have not been able to find any good data on that. Um, we are continuing to look. Um, you know, my what I anticipate for today's meeting is that you will hopefully the committee can give us direction. We'll go back and do some drafting. Um, we will continue to try to find some of that data and bring back whatever we find. It's a, it's it's difficult. Um, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of issues of diversity, the level of diversity on the city council is often tied to the level of diversity in the community. Um, and so a, a little hard, you know, what we've been looking for is, is there a difference? If you've increased the salaries, have you seen a difference in who's able to run, who's able to afford to take the time uh, uh, to serve as council member or mayor. That's what we were really looking for. And that's what we have not really been able to, uh, to grab hold of. Yvette? Yes, um, you definitely touched on something that is concerning me about making the um, income too high to a point where other people of color will not be able to participate in this process because you're going to have higher caliber of people coming to uh, run for the city council. So that is a great concern for me. Um, I wanna make sure that we do increase the income, but I also wanna make sure that we have, have it um, set in a way where people of color can also participate in this process. And then the second thing, uh, question I had was for many of these cities, some of these cities do not have seven council members, they have five. And so um, if we can get a little bit more data and how many um, council members they have, um, that will help with some of the calculations um, moving forward. And then um, one of my other concerns I have is increasing the income too much that it would affect our budget. So if we have any data or any information in regards to what would that look like when we do the increase in relation to our city's budget? And so, you know, there are times when we go through troubles here and then we're laying off people and staff members. So could we get some information or data in relation to that? Um, I don't want to, you know, price it where we're so, we're so high and then all of a sudden we got to keep the council members income intact, but then we got to let staff go in the city and those staff members are important for the running of the city. So. I definitely want to see some data, if anything, um, you know, in regards to those those things, those issues I have. Yes, and and thank you. And if I if I can give some quick quick responses to um, the the notion of high caliber candidates, and I put that in air quotes, um, came from the language of the article of a statement of some person. Um, I, I do not want to suggest in any way that, from my perspective you know, what we're shooting, uh, to me, the, I, I hesitated to even raise the city of San Diego um, example, because that's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is to increase diversity, to make it possible for more people um, uh, 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 to serve as uh, council members or to serve as mayor. Uh, and we're not looking uh, as a lawyer, I can certainly say we're certainly not looking for lawyers or <laughs> high income people to be able to run or want to run. What we're looking for is to open up the possibility to people who don't have that wealth and have found it hard to, to carve out time to participate. So I, I, just, wanted, um, um, I just wanted to say that. So. And then in terms of the budget, um, yes, I think once we get some direction from you, um, as to you know where we want to go, we'll certainly look at the budget and the and and the um, uh, impact that it might have on budget. Um, I'll note on in Berkeley, um, they uh, their arguments in favor of J uh, Measure JJ 
uh, did note that the increase uh, in the council member salaries was going to result in only a 0.06% of the city's total um, budget. Um, so uh, in San Diego, on the other hand, um, with a new increase uh, last year at a time of COVID, uh, you know, it was very much that concern. And that was what, what was in the papers was the concern of you're having to lay people off and yet you're giving these very significant increases uh, to council members. So uh, again, depending on how, you know, what direction we get, we'll, we'll certainly have that in, in mind. So um, also you mentioned the number of council members. Um, also, I want to, related to that, um, this is gonna be also tied with your discussion of an at-large mayor. Uh, are you going to be looking to have an at-large full-time mayor? Is it going to be a part, still a part-time mayor, part-time kind of in air quotes? Um, so there's going to be a number of um, moving parts that we'll, we'll be putting together as we, as we draft uh, language, ballot language. So thank you. Karen? Uh, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, and one um, related to the benefits. Um, the uh, dollar amount that's listed for uh, the council members and the mayor, um, that's not total compensation, including benefits. It's just the salary. Is that correct, Sue? That's correct. That's just okay. salary. On, on all of those, it's just salary and not, uh, not benefits. Okay, thank you. And then my second question has to do, and I can't remember if I asked this last time, and if I did, forgive me. Um, why... And maybe uh, uh, Scott or Ernesto could answer this. Why has the council never increased their salary? Um, was it optics because of the time that the you know the city was going through other layoffs in 08 and other times? Um, and so that's a, that's a, a question I have. And then um, if an increase was set by ordinance. Could the council um, not act on that ordinance if there was a, you know, if there was layoffs elsewhere in the city or, uh, you know, budget cuts, salary cuts? Could they say we're not going to go forward with this annual increase that was established by the charter or ordinance? Uh, yes, um, certainly, and and um, again, I'll I'll turn back to the Berkeley measure and to the San Diego measure. Um, San Diego, uh, apparently, there was at least one council member or, or more that declined the increase, uh, even though it was allowed. And the measure JJ in Berkeley um, specifically provides that if um, I'll get that language. Um, if, there, if the city and employee organizations agree to amend compensation to reduce costs of employees, uh, that same will apply uh, to um, the mayor and city uh, and the council members. And yes, even if we set aside kind of the charter amendment or a voter approved, if the council uh, set by ordinance, um, uh, uh, the, the increase is allowed under state law, uh, any one a council member could decline to take that, donate it, uh, or donate it. So, um, and as to the question of why, um, uh, why the council hasn't moved forward on that, um, you know, it's my sense that it is a difficult uh, uh, from an optics perspective. So, um, but the former council members can certainly weigh in as well. Um, Scott, you want to make a comment on that? You just raised your hand. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, and Ernesto can chime in. To my knowledge, we never, at least when I was on council, it was never, ever even discussed. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure optics is a part of it, but, but it never came up in any of the budget discussions, even the initial ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, you think of the big picture, $40 every a year is not much, but we never discussed it, and Ernesto maybe can confirm that. Yeah, that, that. That was the case in my 12 years at the council as well. We've never discussed any salary increase. Yeah, and the other thing, um, um, 
it's when I came on council in 2010, it was $800. I don't know, Ernesto, when you came on, was it the rise at all when you were there? Uh, I don't think there's been any changes uh, in the time that I was there. Yeah, I'm just hearing because I think it's a lot more than the 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's quite possible that it's more than 10 years. Uh, 10 years, uh, when I was looking at when did, uh, when did Santa Rosa pass the 150,000 mark, so in population. Okay. And we, we can bring back the specific date. We can drill down and maybe it's, maybe it's been significantly longer than that, so. I have that, Sue. Oh, you do? Okay, great. Yes, the council compensation was adopted by ordinance in, on September 13th, 2005, establishing $800 a month for council and $1,200 a month for the mayor. So it has not been changed since 2005. So we can, so the council could, could change it by 17 years. And thank you for that clarification. Okay. Uh, Logan. Thanks, Patty. So a few questions for you. Um, so we are tied to state law. Was that an ordinance that did that or a voter ballot measure? Uh, that was, that's in the charter. So it was approved by the voters uh, at some point. I don't know how long that has been in the charter. So I don't know at which point it was uh, it was there, obviously before 2002. So. Okay, and we could put a ballot measure on the ballot that basically just disentangles us from state law, right? That's, it could just Correct. say yes or no, do you wanna disentangle basically to the voter? You would need to, the voters will need to decide not just simply we're not gonna follow, we're not gonna, be tied to state law, they'll need to have a substitute of how, how will compensation be determined? It doesn't, they don't have, the, the voters don't have to set a dollar amount, but have to at least set some, uh, the voters could simply say the salary would be set by ordinance, period. Yeah. And, okay. And so there could be, you could disentangle and then also say, set up a commission with basically no, very little guidance. Like it's on the commission then to make the amount. Could it work that way too? Uh, yes, it could. And the, the three cities um, that uh, have commissions that I that I looked at, I'm sorry, four four cities that have commissions, um, they they varied. Some had almost no guidance just to what whatever is reasonable. Um, some, uh, you know, one two of two of those four tied it to either CPI or to uh, city managers compensation or superior court judge compensation so or median income it, okay and if since that commission is set up by the voters they can make whatever amount they want right it doesn't have to be set in those uh parameters set by right. state law right okay got it right. yeah okay um and just kind of on more of a general question you know can we bundle things together, I guess, on the ballot. I mean, I know there's legal restrictions on that. So maybe explain briefly, like if we're gonna, if we, if we were to make a ballot measure that said, we're not tangled with state law anymore, we're disentangling and we're making a commission, could that be one? Do these have to be separate items on the ballot? No, each, each of the ballot measures will be a single topic and, um, but that's all one topic. So it can do both when we're, 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 we're gonna establish a commission to establish uh, salaries, council member salaries. Okay, I think that's it for my question. Thank you. Ron? Yeah, um, <clears throat> if <clears throat> what a good reason to uh, increase the diversity is that different taxpayers have different priorities. And in the aggregate, I would expect that people in different households, if we look at household income, um, the, the levels of household income uh, will determine to some degree what people's priorities are gonna be. So somebody with a household income of $30,000 would have a different set of priorities from, from somebody who's maybe more capable of being on the board, uh, on the commission, 
uh, with an, an in, a household income of hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, I, I think that some people, and that that has to do with uh, some people can have to work, uh, have to have a, a separate employment, and uh, some people can you know take one dollar a year. Um, so, I, 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 is there any way of knowing historically um, uh, how the income has, has impacted the ability of people to uh, be able to serve on the uh, council? And um, I, I does, is there any way of knowing um, how many people even on the board now or, or historically have had uh, jobs that were full-time part or part-time and that's, that that will that will affect who, who can participate in the, the city council correct and and that is uh data that we've been trying to um trying to get uh, it's a little hard to get uh, but certainly uh, because part of it is who is not stepping forward to run uh, because they can't afford it. And I think if we look historically, we currently, our current council uh, has uh, a, a number of uh, people who work full time uh, in other jobs. And it is um, difficult for them uh, in terms of taking the time off work for council meetings, for subcommittee meetings and, and so forth. Um, but I, I don't have the specific information that, 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 that you were suggesting, so. Another part of that is um, for currently and historically, uh, how many hours a week have people uh, in the different positions, mayor and other council members, have, uh, have been, a, how many hours a week have they experienced that they need to work to serve for the city. Yeah, I don't have that data, but I think we could, um, you know, we could get some estimates at least from, well, from, from current council members and from past council members uh, mm -hmm. to the hours that have been required. Thank you. Yvette, you have another question? Yes, I just have a clarifying question for the data points that we have. Um, the comment you made a comment about the benefits um, being separate. So for all the information that we have, um, the benefits are not included in the annual um, price for um, annual income. Correct. That's that's listed on the on the charts. Um, the the salaries do not include the value of the benefits. Okay. And is it possible to <laughs> get that number? Okay. Uh, yes, yes, we can get that those numbers. Well, we can we can get those numbers for Santa Rosa. We can get those numbers for some of the other jurisdictions. Um, it would be hard to get uh, all of that um, for all of the jurisdictions. Um, the value also does uh, vary um, because health the health, the value of the health benefit varies whether it's a single person or a person with a uh, with a family, um, but we do have that information for. Yeah, I just need some comparables, and so that's why I want I want to see okay. those values. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Annie. Um, yes. Um, this is more of your experience and your opinion, Sue. Obviously, Berkeley went up by a huge amount, and I think that if we were to put something like that on the ballot, that it would not pass. What do you think is a percentage that could possibly pass? Um, and I know that's just, this is just your opinion, but we don't wanna put it on there and then just have it fail because it's, it's reaching too far. Um, well, thank you for the question. I'm gonna uh, decline to estimate, estimate what, <laughs> what might pass. Um, I'm not a pollster. I don't have that, um, uh, that expertise, but I, um, I, I'll, I'll just emphasize the council will likely do polling. The council can also adjust uh, if, if, if the committee decides a certain dollar amount, 
Uh, council is, will be free to adjust that after polling if it so desires. Um, and, I, and I'll say again though, that this is a good strong committee um, with folks from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of experiences. And you know, among you, you'll be able, you, you know, you'll have a good sense of you know, what seems reasonable uh, to you, what would be reasonable to uh, an appropriate compensation for council members um, that you would um, you would be able to to explain and uh, uh, to your friends and to other members of the community. Thank you. Uh, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Chair Cisco. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, right now, the I, I believe the Board of Supervisors salaries are tied to the uh, the judges, but it, it's not a straight over 100%, is it? Or is there a calculation or a percentage in there? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I know that they were originally set tied to the judges' salaries, and I don't know whether they increase with the judge's salary, um, but I'll, I'll look into that. And I don't know, I don't know if Rob knows that uh, off the top of his head, so. Don't Sue, but I'll find out. Okay, thanks. Karen, you have another question? I, I do, sorry. Um, I wanna go back to Sue's um, response to Annie about the polling. Um, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear. So. The process is we come up with recommendations to the council. And in the meantime, the council is doing some polling. And so they could adjust the recommendations that we've provided to them based upon the results of the polling. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and the timing clarifies of, a lot for me. Yeah, and the timing of the polling will, will depend on what the, you know, how the council wants to do it. We'll be starting to report at the not next week's meeting, but the following meeting, we're going to start reporting out as to what's happening with the charter review committee and what. Uh, and so, you know, that might trigger some some uh, actions on the part of the council as well so, in terms of polling. Any other questions before I move to public comment? Okay, not seeing any. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, ask for the public comment. If you are watching by Zoom, use the raised hand feature so you can be recognized. If you're dialing in by phone, dial star nine. And with that, I'll open public comment on uh, this item for council compensation. Um, Chair Cisco, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, great, thanks. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring it back to the committee and um, go into our uh, discussion phase. Um, just wanna set a couple of ground rules. I mean, obviously we're applying the lens that we've been working on for equity. Um, we also were given um, at the, uh, the beginning of our first meeting, the, uh, the council, um, policies regarding civility. I don't think that'll be an issue here, but everybody remember <laughs> that we're being respectful of each other's comments. Um, also be respectful of the time that you take. Uh, we wanna be able to hear from everybody. Um, and so, you know, to be uh, sort of um, compiling your comments with uh, the recommendation questions that uh, Sue gave us First of all, do we wanna recommend that uh, the council put in the charter the increase? And if so, um, how, would we, how would we go about doing that, setting it, et cetera? So what your thoughts are on that would be a, a, a great beginning to our discussion from each person. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open our time for discussion. And so who would like to start? Don't everybody jump in there at once. <laughs> okay, good. All right, now I'm seeing it. Okay, okay, Logan, how about you? I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, 
I'm not a pollster, but I do politics for a living and um, can't predict the future. But I have a feeling that having an exact number might not be the best way to do this. I think that that could become kind of a lightning rod for controversy. And then we might lose focus on the why, you know, that's the that's the what of the ballot measure, basically. So we need to tell that story of how much work these folks do, that it's a full time job. And I worry that if we make it, you know, 50,000 or 75,000 or whatever, you know, nice round number we might land on, that that could become too much of the focus. Now, just let me to disagree with myself. I also think it'd be easier to explain, like Sue said, you know, if you're going out to the average person saying, pay the council 50 grand a year is really easy to say. Um, but I also don't know that from a policy perspective that a big round number really gets us where we want to go in getting us a diverse, a more diverse council. So uh, I'm not, I'm leaning towards doing an area median income type calculation. And I think to make we that, out a little bit. oh, are you, can you still hear me? Okay. Um, that yeah, might we be can now better. Oh, Patty, that might be on your end. Um, you're kind oh, of, I'm the only, and, only one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyways, uh, so I think that area median income or something like that's a better way to go. I think that maybe it could be like 50% of area median income because I agree that $92,000 is probably too much to ask people. And then I want to throw out another thought. A resident said something smart to me and that people aren't going to pay money for something they're getting for free already. So they already get the council that they get now. So we need to restructure it in some way. And I think that that might be a different ballot measure. And that's sort of where I was going, Sue, with part of my question. And, you know, one idea that that person had was term limits. So maybe you sort of guard against that cynicism that people have that, oh, this is going to be a way for people to make money for 20 years of their life. Maybe we set up eight or 12 year max. So just throwing out those ideas for folks, I think we need to readjust the way people think about the council. And also I think a, a, an even dollar amount would be that type of lightning rod. So those are my thoughts. Love to hear from everyone else. Okay, thanks, Logan. How about you, Scott? Sorry, I, my uh, fingers don't move fast enough on the iPad. Um, I think a lot of what Logan just said um, makes sense. I think one of the um, issues, pardon me for a moment, one of the issues that I can speak from experience because I do have a full-time job. I did have a full-time job when I was on council. Um, being a council member is less work than being mayor. Being mayor is a 40 hour a week job, at least. And when you have another 40 hour job, um, my only saving grace as someone who thought he could prove that you can work and have a job and work part time on council is that I had a very understanding business partner who picked up the slack because um, I couldn't have done it otherwise. Um, so I think an adjustment is is right. But Logan made the comment and I think he's has a good point about it. it's a broader issue because the, the whole point of this is to increase diversity and representation on council well everybody out there unless you're retired has a job has a career and it's a big leap to say okay i am going to um, jump and run for office and boy, I'll have a job for four years and I'll pay whatever, but then what happens to my regular job and what happens if I don't get reelected? Um, term limits, I think is an interesting concept, but then you're asking somebody, well, yeah, you're gonna serve four years or eight years and then you're kind of off to whatever. It's a, that's a conundrum. And I don't know that, that we're gonna solve it with compensation. Um, it's gotta be a more comprehensive look I do think Logan's point of, you know, picking a percentage of, of the median income and is probably a smart way of going um, to try and sell it because we do need to increase compensation. I guess my point is, I just don't think it's going to uh, be the, the, the solution to the issue. 
um, that I that, that won't solve all the problems. It'll make the burden a little easier to carry. Um, and I think we need to do it. Um, Chris. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little concerned with what the rationale is that we're using. You know, I think each one of us might have our own feelings as to whether it should be increased and what's fair and so on. But, you know, with different feelings about the problem that we're looking to address, but without evidence out there as to what works, we're all kind of guessing as to if you want to increase diversity, does it do it? And if so, how much do you pay to increase diversity? So I'm a little concerned about that as we discuss things and, and reach a decision. Um, in terms of increasing, um, my initial sense is that you compare apples to apples and city council people are basically executives. And so to compare them to executive city staff, uh, for me, at least has some common sense appeal because you're saying that's that's the value. We've already decided what the value of that work is. So some percentage of whether it's the city manager, or assistant, or some blend with a cost, you know, a cap with a cost of living increase or rather cap so that it doesn't go out of control. Um, we'll have to consider what the mayor does. And I, I'm inclined uh, to be disinclined for commission. Uh, because that seems to be just having a politically appointed body every two years, whatever year it is, that will have whatever level of trust or distrust the community has to begin with. It's just like punting the issue. So I would think when we make a decision, to make a decision and to, to set it. Thanks. Yvette? Yes, um, I like to say uh, what San Diego did with the attaching it to the judicial system, absolutely not. I don't think we should do anything like that. I feel like that would bankrupt the city. And then um, in relation to maybe doing a medium, I, I kind of agree with that, um, taking a medium, but it, it there's a lot that's surrounding that because in relation to an elected mayor versus not having an elected mayor would make would change my decision and how we move forward with compensation. So I, I kind of need to, I think we kind of need to have that conversation along with compensation about elected mayor and not elected mayor, because that definitely will play a lot into how I make my decision in relation to calculations and things of that nature. And then um, one of the things that would probably uh, be a big um, thing for people of color or someone that may you know, not make a lot in the community is healthcare. So they may opt to have more healthcare. They might want to have their entire family covered and maybe take less pay because they want to have health insurance. So those are some of the things we need to take a look at when we're thinking about this because healthcare, it, uh, honestly, is very expensive. So they may say, I opt to have the healthcare and pay me less. So those are some things that might be something that people in low income areas may, may want to have part of uh, their package. And so maybe having it, you know, a discussion and have a couple options available to the possible, uh, you know, um, city council members and what they would like their package to look like. And I know that's opening a, a can of worms but I think it needs to be more directed to whoever gets on council. What does that look like for that person? Because that's true DEI right there, is having that conversation with whoever just um, was able to win and have that conversation and say, okay, what would, what would your package look like? So I'm just throwing that out there because it does make a difference in who we're gonna get and the caliber of people we're gonna get to be able to run. And we want people that have a heart for the city, not to bankrupt us. So if we have people that have a heart for the city, they may take some other form of compensation in order to be a council member. Thanks, Yvette. Uh, Ron. Um, <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> I, it, this is gonna be a difficult one. We haven't talked about it, but uh, the structure of the family is gonna make a difference and who can join the uh, council, uh, a single parent, with four children versus uh, uh, two uh, uh, working adults 
with uh, uh, old uh, college students and, and two uh, retired people uh, are going to have different set of priorities and 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 all of their priorities are important and uh, so we're going to as we go through this process to give some idea some some thought into um, how are we restricting who can come onto the council or yeah, et cetera. So that's something we have to think, consider. Thanks, Ron. Um, Jen. Thanks. Um, I have several comments. But I want to start by agreeing with um, Yvette that I think that the conversation around um, elected mayors from mayor model really should be part of this discussion. I think it does influence. Um, it, and and then I and then I want to say I, I agree with Logan that this should be based on AMI. Um, and and I think that for for many reasons. But um, most of all, I think that we should be focusing on creating a defensible rationale rather than what's electable at this point. If we should create a rationale that is aspirational and aligns with the city's values, aligns with our values. Um, and if polling needs to adjust that later, that's okay. But so far, I think that you know the city has, has um, stated it has a strong um, equity ethic. I think this group has stated the same. Um, and so I think that should be top of mind when we're, we're uh, talking about our rationale. And it should be a rationale that makes sense. Um, which is why I'm not at all interested in looking at other cities without knowing the specific history behind them. First of all, like mathematically, the standard deviation of those numbers is enormous, which makes the, you know, any comparison somewhat ridiculous. Um, and then just the political nature of it, the historical nature of it, I think those numbers don't mean anything unless we know exactly how we got there. So it makes more sense to me for us. This is a group that is a thoughtful group to come up with our own rationale and one that um, makes sense. Um, comparing to judges, I don't even know where they started with that. I think that makes no sense and not even worth getting into. Um, I'm talking fast because I have a lot of comments here. Um, so I do think that this should be reflective of the average income in the city. Um, that would you know, reflect the overall um, prosperity of the city, whether that is going up or going down to some degree. Um, it, it makes you somewhat um, reflective of, of the common of the average person. Um, and, but when I say it should be reflective of the AMI or based on the AMI, I'm saying it should be at least 100% AMI. Um, and the reason for that is that unless you are paying someone with a family a living wage, then we are not addressing the issue of equity. It's just sort of a de facto volunteer job. And it might, or it's giving someone who is already of, of good means just more money in their pocket and somebody who isn't, it's just keeping them poor. So if you're paying someone 50, 60% AMI, they are housing cost burden, they can barely make ends meet, or they're still working two jobs, or they can't take the risk to run. So it's not going to address the issue of diversity. Um, we either want to address that issue and do something to change it, or it's almost not worth doing. Um, I think that, you know, paying someone, and this is just the average, right? The average median income also, you know, treats people like professionals. Um, it respects the risk that they're taking by running. Um, respects the fact that there's a lack of stability in the position um, and that it's very public and, and very difficult in that way sometimes. And it also allows us as, as, uh, as voters to hold electeds accountable for making this a professional full-time job. We want you to do it that well. Um, as for the evidence, you know, Chris brought up whether or not there's evidence that this you know, deals with our problem. I think it's way too soon to say the sample size is too low. The length of time that people are do, doing this is too low. There's just, I, I don't think there's an opportunity to have the evidence. I would love to make an evidence-based decision, but I think it's too, too soon. And I think the reason it's too soon is because this making local elected positions, volunteer positions is like the ultimate example of structural inequity, if not structural racism in our, in our society. And so if we don't you know, address that and recognize that and change it in a real way, not just, um, it, 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 it can't just be a, a nod to it or it, then, then we're not gonna make a difference. So those are my thoughts and um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Jen. Ernesto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
I, I would have to say that in my 12 years at the council, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the, of the council members have changed dramatically and they continue to change. Uh, this is not the council, the, the duties and responsibilities that we had years ago, even back in 2005, when uh, the last salary was, was uh, set. Uh, and you know, the role of the council members goes beyond what's on the agenda. It's, it's gotten bigger. And, but we've also made a lot of progress. We've made some big steps with diversity and inclusion and moving towards our district, district elections, for example. Council compensation would be one more of those steps in moving in that direction too. And I do agree that the AMI is a good place to, to start to look at that uh, and not going low. I mean, giving the council the flexibility and move forward to examine what, what they feel might be workable out there with the community. But clearly, um, no, no one should be put in a position of having to be in a position of giving themselves a raise. That's an awkward position to put anybody in. Uh, you know, we're, we're here for the people, for, the, for our residents, for the voters. We're accountable to them every four years. I think that's already in place. Uh, but I also believe that the expectations of our community have increased as well. Uh, the, the things that we do are, have become more and more complex, you know, dealing now with our homeless issues and so many other social issues that we deal with as council members, so that has changed. So one of the things that we do have to do moving forward is make sure that we tell the story because there are a lot of stories out there to be told by those who have served, those who are currently served, those who didn't serve because they chose not to and, and understanding why they, they didn't do that. Uh, you know, dealing with issues related to child care, elder care, there's just so many other factors that come into play. Uh, the information that, that Sue provided related to the cities, that's good information to look at. But then again, we come back to the, uni the uniqueness of our own community and what we want and what we expect from our council members. Uh, so I, I do agree with, uh, with prior comments about the AMI. I don't have a set number and I, I am intrigued by, by going high and having some flexibility to go low because I think if we go too low, I can't see our council members currently say, well, I don't like that we're going to go higher than what you recommended. Again, I don't want to put them in that position. Uh, so, but I also agree that this is also tied into the future conversation about a direct, a directly uh, elected mayor. And then going back to the duties and responsibilities, the other thing that has changed with district elections is that there's also more uh, engagement now at that level too within your district. So it's not just the mayor. You're not just talking about the entire council. But I think that. Uh, you know, council members, and, I, and Scott can speak to this too, regardless of whether it was something that was really an issue with the city, you were there for your constituents to, to listen to them. When they called, you listened. And, and that's an expectation I think our community has. So I don't think that's going to change. So I like the direction that we are heading in. Uh, and again, I just want to add my two cents in supporting some conversation related to AMI. Great. Um, Jasmine. Thank you, Chair Cisco. Um, I am also in agreement that um, AMI would be a good place to, um, a good measure to determine future council member compensation. And, and, you know, I think the narratives of the council members present and past are very important in being able to describe and illustrate the work um, that is, you know, that is um, done, you know, the extra work. And, and um, you know, I also, sympathize or empathize um, with the notion that it is a difficult position to be in, right? To vote, to raise your own salary. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that may have um, been why it hasn't been done before, right? The optics. And I wonder if um, there is possibility that um, the, if the measure were to pass to um, implement council salary, if there could be an implementation date of post the next election, right, that it wouldn't go, it wouldn't actually apply to the electeds that are, you know, making this or, or, you know, unless they're elected again, or even until somebody else is elected for that position. Um, and because it's part of the charter review, I wonder if it's bound by like charter review rules, or if it could be part of the measure. Karen, you have another comment? Yeah, a couple. Um, I would like to, and Sue, I'm sorry, this is more work for you guys. Um, what is the average uh, salary of, the city, of city employees? Not the lowest, not the highest, but the average. I'd like to see that. Um, I think that might be a guide um, rather than the AMI 
of the general population in Santa Rosa. Um, I would not be in favor of any kind of a commission. I think that's just kicking the can down the road as the saying goes. Um, and also I agree with those who spoke about um, that this is really a discussion also tied to the directly elected mayor. So I'm not sure if we can come to any kind of a conclusion on this uh, until we have that discussion. Thank you. Ron? <clears throat> well, uh, this is long-term thinking, but uh, each uh, one, we're going to have an election. We get these uh, booklets that describe the pros and cons of different positions. We're going to need to be able to, in a very short period of uh, short, a small area uh, in those booklets, how we justify what we're recommending so that uh, so that the voters can decide you know that's a good idea and this is why we ought to oppose it or um, approve it okay Adriana Hi, um, at the risk of not sounding repetitive, I'm just gonna be very succinct. I think um, I agree with um, most of the points that have been discussed here, um, specifically with the use of a calculation method such as that annual medium income, which I presume that's what we're referring to when we're using the acronym AMI. Um, and, and also for there to be more discussion around even having term limits around that. I know um, that's something that Logan brought up and I, I, I actually agree with being intentional about that for several reasons. Um, one of them is that it also promotes actually movement and diversity in the council um, and for folks not to be elected forever and ever just because they're incumbents, for example. So movement promotes that kind of growth. Um, and just to take it a little step back, um, I just wanted to clarify a little bit on um, our own, let's see, the equity, um, our, our, our equity principles that um, we just reviewed earlier today I presume that they uh, apply only to this um, charter or this charter committee, not for the entire city of Santa Rosa. And just uh, and, and the, the reason I'm bringing this up is just from that perspective in one of the principles and to make sure that we all have access here because we're all different um, to just be mindful of the amount of acronyms that we use because that also can become an issue and just to be mindful to just explain and use simple language if at all possible. That's all, thank you. Um, I would just make a comment that, um, you know, I was on the charter review committee 10 years ago and we were taking a look then at, um, at, at the potential of district elections and uh, you know, which ultimately the voters turned down. But but one of the difficulties was, uh, you know, the the way, the reasons for promoting district elections was uh, a lot of the members talked about the cost of campaigning that that would bring down the cost of campaigning and have sort of average our neighbor be able to campaign and actually gain a seat on the city council. But a bigger concern certainly for me was what's the cost of serving because you know the, the some districts uh, definitely are more impoverished than others and and so um, I'm very much in favor of uh, making some kind of adjustment um, I like the the uh, attachment to uh, the median income as well and I think I'm generally hearing a consensus in that direction to explore that as our, you know, in, in trying to answer your question, Sue, to give, give you a direction. Um, but I'm also hearing that we might not be able to get to a complete direction tonight on this item because we want to be including information on the directly elected mayor. Um, so what, what are you thinking about kind of where we are so far and what do we need to do that would be helpful to you? We're not, we're, I don't think we're going to re reach our goal tonight of having an actual complete direction for you. 
No, this is this has been very helpful. Um, and yes, I'm also hearing that consensus about a tie to AMI and also a consensus on we need to be looking at the direct elect mayor uh, issue as well. And in fact, as I think you and I, uh, or I mentioned to you the other day, uh, the direct elect mayor, mayor uh, issue will be the next, next item that we take up. So starting at our next meeting, uh, we'll be bringing some information to you uh, about uh, direct elect mayors. Um, you might notice on the charts that we provided, we also included whether they're charter cities and then whether they have a direct elect mayor. And that was interesting to me that really um, um, large majority of the cities do have a direct elect mayor. So we'll be bringing that starting next week. And again, would anticipate two meetings uh, to, to be talking about that. In the meantime, we can also be starting to um, look at some options for how we draft um, a uh, council compensation that addresses, that's somehow tied to AMI and that also addresses benefits. I've heard that from a couple of council uh, committee members. Um, and we'll give you options and we'll give you the dollar amounts. We'll provide the chart that we have for, uh, for the uh, median income uh, you know, at different levels, what that would translate to. Um, and I think that'll be helpful for the committee as well. So what we'll be doing is for next meeting, we'll start the discussion on the direct elect mayor and we will um, start, I don't know whether we'll be providing the information to you on some of the, just the background uh, information for connection to AMI, but some options of how we might word that, how we might tie it either to a percentage, you know, whether it's a hundred percent or something less, um, how we might, how we might uh, link that. So we'll, we'll provide you with some options and maybe we can talk about whether we want to bring that all. And what I'm thinking is we may want to wait and bring all of that together after we've had the discussion about the direct elect mayor, and then we can be bringing some options kind of as a package on those two, those two issues. If well, that, that's what I'm hearing from the members is they really, they really need that information uh, about what our direction might be for a directly elected mayor in order to, to fully decide this particular one. So if that works, then I think that's a good plan. Yes, happy to do that. Um, I know the other, this I'll just ask for some clarification. I also was hearing several people mention term limits um, and uh, that was term limits were not on the council's a, a, a list of items, but certainly the council also anticipated that items might come up through the committee. Um, and is that something that you want us to begin to to look at as well um, as a committee, or is it still a little premature to go there? Um, committee members, can you, uh, I guess, do a thumbs up as to whether or not it's a little premature, what, where, where you wanna take a look at that or not? It's a pretty big item. Is a thumbs up premature or not? Is that what's the question? I would, let's start with premature and, uh, and go from there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, oops, I just lost everybody. Okay, so so it's looking to me like it's premature. And, but what we'll get, we're gonna keep that um, in mind, uh, but definitely, Want to be seeing how do we marry the discussion of council compensation along with the discussion of a directly elected mayor because it does change kind of everything. So, yes. um, does that feel like you got what you need, Sue? Uh, okay. Yes, um, I and feel committee member. A bit of any Patty, I'm this sorry, is Karen. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Oh, I, I have another question. Um, Okay. You know, is, is it possible to get the um, uh, median salary of city employees? Because I think that would be, um, I know that it seems like the overall um, sentiment is AMI, but I would be interested to see what the city employee average income is. 
Thank to you. have that comparison. <laughs> yeah. And we can get okay. that. Thank you. Okay. And Jasmine? Thank you. Um, yeah, I was also wondering um, if Attorney Gallagher can look into um, whether implementation has to be immediately upon adoption of a council member compensation or whether the measure can stipulate otherwise. And then um, I was also thinking that it actually might be useful to think about um, term limits, maybe not for the whole council, but while we're considering directly elected mayor, like whether that position would be, um, would have term limits. And maybe this isn't like an item we take on as like, you know, ask the staff for a full report or, or something like that, but just like have it as a consideration. Um, I don't know, that was just a thought. Thank you. And, and if I quickly respond, yes, um, there is flexibility in terms of implementation date. Um, and in fact, the, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll bring forward, once we come back after we've talked about direct elect mayor, we'll come back when we're giving options as to effective dates as well. So, um, and then, you know, we, we can talk some more um, later about term limits, so. And okay. it's interesting to note that the currently there are limits uh, for mayor uh, and for vice mayor in the uh, in the existing charter. So not term limits to be on council, but term limits as to how long you can be mayor consecutively. So, Patty, and, can I make a quick point? Sure, go ahead. Uh, just term limits was one item that was suggested to me, and just my point was that we need to, you know reset the way people think about the job. And I think that that's one way we could do it. And so I would encourage all the other committee members to think about ways that a voter would think about this in a new way or see it in a new light. So that was that was where I was going with that. It was just one way to do that. Okay. Uh, Ron, you have another question? I, I would like to know what are the responsibilities of the council members and the mayor? so that we can, I mean, what are they doing uh, that, that takes the t their time up? Okay, Adriana. I wanna just dovetail on what Logan said uh, just a little bit ago about thinking about the job and what we're doing in different ways. Um, as we are trying to employ and embed equity into the work that we're doing. And this actually also speaks to something that Jen said earlier um, today is that there may be not any evidence and that us basing ourselves on what has been done in the past is kind of like uh, the cycle of insanity, right? We continue to repeat <laughs> the same patterns. So I think it's very important to just <laughs> think about that um, when we're thinking in, in a framework of equity um, and we're thinking of, about evidence-based, evidence-based is from a framework of white institutions. Um, so we need to think that that is collected from that perspective and we don't necessarily have evidence for what the communities are already doing and for what we know. So maybe we can be responsive and informed from listening to our community voices, but we just need to be cautious when we use evidence-based or evidence-informed practice. Um, not to say, I am a clinician and I, I really adhere to that, but we just need to be very cautious as we're trying to think outside of the box. And that's just my comment. Great, thanks for that, Adriana. Um, any other comments before we close this item? And you're good to go, Sue, with this item? I am, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so with that, uh, we no, no, item number five, there are no committee chairs, city attorneys reports, is that correct? That's correct from my perspective. Correct from mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have no subcommittees. Uh, any written or electronic communications from our host? Sorry, we had no, um, no written communications. Okay, and then um, last but not least, uh, which we do have to do a public comment on is future agenda items. Um, do you wanna just repeat what we're, what we're doing next meeting? 
Sure, the next meeting we will begin discussion um, of uh, direct elect mayor. Um, that will be our primary element. Um, we do still have the standing um, item on equity principles. Uh, we will continue that, so. Okay, great. Uh, so with that, we do have to take Oops, public sorry. comment. Oops, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Brian. Uh, Go ahead, yeah. Brian, sorry, I missed you. Yeah, I have a question on the um, direct elected mayor and uh, maybe the chair and vice chair and staff can look into it. But um, if guest speakers are appropriate, uh, it'd be interesting to hear from a, an ex elected mayor. Uh, Petaluma's <laughs> got three or four of them. Uh, I'm sure uh, there's others that, you know, through maybe the city attorney's network, but uh, I'd sure like to hear from someone been there, done that, the pluses and minuses. Um, that isn't a current sitting one that may have a little bias to it. So just a suggestion, I'll leave it up to the chairs and staff to determine if we should invite somebody and who that might be. Thank you. Yeah, great. That's yeah. actually something we've been talking about is, is very important. So yeah. thanks for that. Um, uh, Logan. Yeah, just in response to that, I think a guest speaker is fine, but I want us to just keep in mind we're not anything like Petaluma. And I think Jen kind of made that point looking at all those different data points among the different cities. It's such a wide discrepancy. And I just, in my own personal pet peeve, I hate when we get compared to other cities in Sonoma County um, <laughs> because we're just on a totally different scale. And the mayor of Petaluma does have a bigger job than the rest of the council. So I think it's fair to, to kind of ask them in that way, you know, what is your job like? But I just, I want to caution us to not, you know, talk to the mayor of like some other smaller city. I just, I, I just get frustrated when we use that frame to look at our city. So that's all. Okay, Chris. Thanks. I'm wondering when the preparation is being done for the elected mayor, what combinations of that we're looking at? Uh, a mayor that votes on the council or a mayor that doesn't vote, uh, reducing the number of uh, districts from seven to six or not. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering if the different combinations would be presented. And Annie? Just real quickly to what Logan was speaking about. We do have Tom Schwenholm who's been our mayor who is an outgoing city council member. So he may be able to speak about Santa Rosa and what the responsibilities were. Great idea. Uh, Jen. Sorry, it takes me so long to unmute. Um, I, just along the lines, if we're gonna have um, mayors talk who've been in the strong mayor position, I think it would be interesting to have, if it's possible, to find a counterpart city manager. I think you know that's one of the mm -hmm. challenges in, in in city elected offices is sort of the tension between city manager and, and staff and and um, city council. I don't mean to challenge in the, or tension in an adversarial sense, but um, the push pull of responsibility. So I, I I would think that that would be an interesting thing to hear more about since we haven't experienced that here. Great, thanks. Anna. Just a food for thought. Um, is there a possibility, since we're throwing names out there, that we could possibly bring in Mr. Chris Korski since he does have, since he was prior mayor and he has relations as a county employee as of today, I believe? Okay. And Anyone else wanting to make a comment or throw out a suggestion? Not seeing anybody. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and open up uh, item eight, future agenda items to our members of the public. Again, if you're participating by Zoom, use the raised hand feature. Uh, if you're dialing in by phone, use star nine. And I will ask our host if we have any other speakers? Um, Chair Cisco, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, thank you. Um, well, 
Thank you all for your very thoughtful uh, comments and participation. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and adjourn tonight's meeting and uh, we will reconvene on, what's our date, the, the 19th? Sorry. And, and Whatever our next regularly scheduled meeting is. Would be the. It is. 19th. It is the 19th. Okay, good to be sure. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.